Okay, so first of all, good morning everybody. Thank you. Uh, it is really a ple pleasure for me to be here giving this presentation for you this morning. And you guys might have already noticed I'm not from around here, so I have a strong accent. And please, if I say something that you guys don't under did not understand or didn't make a lot of sen sen uh, sense, please let me know. I'll be more than glad to try to repeat or say that in a different way or matter. So, uh, the slides are moving here, but not in the big screen. Alright guys, so the main goal of this presentation is basically we are going to go through some of the smooth grass background and, and actually the, the real main goal is try to go through some of the biological information that this weed has which really, really help us to have a, a pretty good understanding what makes this weed such a successful weed and why is it so hard to, to manage it properly. And we are also going to go through some of the most common management methods that we have for weed control in pastures and try to make a correlation with it. what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of each different method when we are thinking about using it as a management tool to control as much grass populations. And finally, we are going to wrap up with some conclusions. So, smooth grass is a member of, uh, of the Sporobulus genus which is a, a type of a genus, a type of plant, that has approximately 150 different species, which are commonly found in the tropics, subtropics, and warmer temperate areas of the world. And many of these species have spread, and they are now important agronomic and environmental concern in many parts of the world, for example here in the United States, in, in Australia, and in Brazil. And when, I'm tr when I was trying to find some information about smudge grass management, most of the research has been done in, 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 in these three countries. So here in the United, United States, uh, as much grass is commonly found in planted grass pastures, roadsides and disturbed waste places. And we actually have 11 different species, in which two were introduced and are considered invasive. And they are the small smut grass and the giant smut grass. So the small smudge grass, which is the one on the left, on the picture on the left, it is the one that is more spread throughout the entire country. It can be found in 23 different states here in the US, in the US. whereas giant smudge grass is, is more of a problem for Florida, especially in South and Central Florida, but it is working its way up north. Some, now we have some like uh, observations that it has been found in, in, in Georgia, Louisiana and Mississippi. So basically the main difference among these two plants, first of all is the size, as the name suggests, the small smudge grass is smaller than the giant one, usually will reach 2 to 3 feet in height, while the giant one can reach 3 to 4. And maybe the main way, or the easiest way to separate them apart is to look, in, look into the seed head, Usually, the small one will have the black color in the seed head, and that's because of the presence of a fungus, a, a smut. And the seed heads are not as open and branched as the giant one has. So it's more oppressive, kind of, you can see that in the picture. Now, in terms of management so far, it is the, both for, it is the same for both species. So kind of, so far, think about what we have, uh, we don't actually need to identify dense and know which one is small, which one is giant. However, at the same time, it's very important to be able to tell the them apart and be able to know the difference because you never know when like some different managements can pop up. And the first thing when you think about weed management is weed identification. 
So, so this is what this is much greater. So now we are going to go through why is it such a problem. First of all, because it's an invasive. And so basically, just a, a short definition of invasive plant. Invasive plants are all the plants that can successfully establish, become natural, naturalized, and spread to new natural habitats without further assistance from humans. And that's kind of a big problem because there are a lot of a lot of biological uh, pro uh, problems related related when we have a, a spread and in invasion of invasive weeds. First of all, invasive plants they reduce the biodiversity of our natural ecosystems. Sometimes they can encroach upon endangered and threatened species in their habitats. We have loss of habitat for native insects, birds, and other wildlife. We can see some alterations to the frequency and intensity of natural fire, and that's especially true with much grass because it really likes fire. And finally, we can have some disruptions of the native plant animal associations, such as pollination, seed dispersal, and host plant relationships. So, what about that? And much grass is not just a threat to natural ecosystem, it is, a, it is also a problem for our improved pastures, for our forage based livestock system, systems. And the main reason is because when we have as much grass infestations in our pastures, we have a decrease in the production potential of our pasture. And why does it matter? Because forages, they are not just the largest nutritional input for our animals, but they are also the cheapest, especially in the cow calf sector. So, in summary, when we have less forest production, we have a decrease in the herd production level, as well as in the economic returns from the land. So, for example, just taking a look on these pictures, we might, which picture, the one on the left or the right, you think we will be able to support higher stocking rates or have the same animal performance with less supplemental feed? So, how they actually in, uh, interfere with our test <coughs> productivity? First of all, probably the main problem is because there is a competition for resources. So, mainly being water, nutrients, uh, space, and light. And we have some research that has been done by the University of Florida, and they found that Bahia grass pastures infested, infested with medium and high infestations, they had a decrease in Bahia grass yield around 30 to 70 percent, respectively which resulted in losses around $25 to $50 per acre, depending on the density. So, as much grass is also a problem, that's, and we are going to talk a little bit more about that on the next talk, but because it's much grass, usually, especially when it's mature, mature, has a very low nutritive value. So, basically, what that means is that when you have a, a lot of much grass in the pasture, and they are kind of big and old, like this much grass, uh, that we have in the picture on the right. What happens is that the animals will kind of overgraze in our desirable pasture. And that's a problem because we are decreasing the production potential and, uh, and we can also, if the grazing intensity is too high, we can decrease the persistence of our improved pasture. So, but basically, when you have as much grass, uh, because the animals will normally not graze it when it's like mature, like that, has a lot of advantages in terms of competition against the other grass that has been con continuous grazed, grazed every time. <coughs> and the result of that is like, is we have a spread over the years, the, spread, the, the infestation just, just gets, gets worse. Another problem with much grass is shading. So, especially for hair grass, it's a type of grass that really does not tolerate very well shading. So, it's very common to see in the field, underneath or close the, the clump, canopy, that is basically not, no, not even, no, no as much grass going, growing in that area. Alright, so, I put together this slide, just trying to give you guys an idea about the, this much grass species timeline here in Florida, kind of giving a, a background on when we first realized that smudge grass was a problem and also which type of when we started doing research on smudge grass management here at the station. So, back in the 1950s, these two gentlemen here in the picture, on the left is Dr. Hodge and on the right is Dr. Mislev. 
So Dr. Hodge was actually the first professor here at the station that started doing some work with much grass management. And that was around 1950s. And it was not a it was, it was not a big issue by then. However, just around 20 years later, uh, there was an estimation that approximately 75% of the improved pastures in Central Florida were infested with smudge grass. And we were talking about small smudge grass back then. And then later, in the 1990s, the giant smudge grass one was first detected in South Florida and really started to replace the small one. And Right now, this, the giant smudge grass is our, the main one that is more, more commonly found in Florida and is more uh, a, a big of a problem than smaller, especially in the south. And then another uh, estimation that was made in the 2012-2013 was that at least, or probably more than 50% of all Bahia grass pastures in, Florida, in the in center in south Florida were infested with giant smudge grass. And then, this is where we are at today. This, uh, I took a picture with Dr. Hoss during the field day that we had, and I thought it was interesting because that, at least for me, and that bring, brings up a question. 1950s and now we are in 2018, so that's around 68 years, and we are still doing research with much grass management. So, why? Why is it much grass? It's, still, it's such like a it is still a serious issue even after 60 years of research, and that's kind of, a, of one of the goals of this presentation. So this is a multiple choice question. I will ask your help to answer this question. So alternative A is because it's much grass is pretty. Alternative B is because you have a very limited number of herbicides that are actually effective and selective. And what I mean by selective is that we can apply to our pastures and they are safe. They will not harm our pastures and we will only kill the weeds. It is because the researchers have no idea what they are doing. Please don't say this answer because this will get me in trouble with Dr. Sellers. <laughs> Letter D is because this much grass has a diverse set of biological tools which enables it to thrive even under many different envi environments and management practice. And then letter E, which would be letter B and D. So, do you, which one do you think is the right, right, right answer? Uh, A. <laughs> that might be. So, yes, there are, there are a lot of different reasons for that, but in my opinion, the main ones are, first, it's very hard to control it, and it's very expensive. We have just one herbicide that is selective to be applied over the top of our pastures, and Sometimes that once will not even work, and we are going to talk a little bit more about that. In, in, the, in, the, in the other reason, which is letter D, which we are going to go through now, is because as much grass has a lot of tools, it's very well equipped to really cope well with many of the different types of environments and management. So, before we actually start talking about biology, uh, I think it's important to know how is it helpful, why should we know the biological features of weeds when we are planning how to manage them. First of all, it's because the biological characteristics of weeds, they will determine the weeds adaptability and susceptibility to various different types of management, which really help us to tailor what is the, the better and what is the most effective management practice that we should be using with each type of weed. For example, such as when is the appropriate timing that we should go there and control them, and what is the proper control method that we should be using. And I think that among all the different types of biological features that we could talk about, the most important ones are the ones related first to the germination requirements and emergence patterns, second, the reproductive biology in the life cycle of the weed, the growth habit, the persistence in the soil seed bank, and also the how they disperse, the mode of dispersal. And we're going to go through each one of the topics just looking at much grass. So what are these much grass germination requir requirements for life? Basically, no germination requirements. It can germinate regardless of the presence of life. In terms of temperature, we have a, a little, we have a, some difference between the small one and the giant one. The small is much grass, germination may be higher when temperatures are relatively low. So usually that would be happening in late winter or early spring. 
While the giant is much grass, the germination may be a little bit higher when temperatures are relatively high, so it would be usually during mid-summer or fall. However, that, doesn't, that is not necessarily true when, because when conditions are favorable, germination could be happening year-round. In terms of soil pH, it turns out that as much grass seeds can germinate over a very wide range of pH ranges from 4 to 10, and the maximum germination has been observed in pH between 6 to 8. So basically what that means is, when you think about soil pH, we, first of all we, we sh should not think about let's change the pH to try to control it. The goal of pH is always to meet the target of the forest. So for example, Bahia grass, the soil pH target is around 5.5. So th this information basically means that for the ideal soil pH for Bahia grass, as much grass will be growing just fine or maybe even better. In terms of water, uh, basically as almost all plants, they, are, they, they like, they favor most environments, they need water to germinate. And because of that, germination might not be occurring until early mid-June when summer rain begins. But again, like I said previously, it can be year-round when conditions are favorable. In terms of depth of burial, uh, depth of burial is something that greatly affects seeds emergency uh, because emergency is way greater when the seeds are located in the, in the top of the soil surface. However, especially for a giant one, which has a little bit bigger seeds than the small, some germination can still occur when they are a little bit deeper in the soil. So, if you think that, ah, okay, uh, germ seeds will not germinate if they are too deep. However, and then we think about where are located most of the seeds. There was some research done in Australia, and they found that around 70% of all the seeds in the soil, they are located in the top one centimeter, which is like half an inch, so it is, it is a very good area for the seeds, so if most of the seeds are in the place they, sh they need to be in order to germinate, which it's not a good thing. So some conclusions about germination and immersion patterns. As much grass can germinate and emerge over a wide range of light, temperatures and soil pH situations, and basically, germination and emergency will most likely be occurring during the entire Bahia grass season. Therefore, in terms of management, when you think about that, it is very hard to prevent seed germination and seed emergence, especially when we are using a single application of any type of control management technique. What about reprodu reproductive biology and life cycle? So, as much grass reproduces by seeds, is a sexual type of reproduction. However, sometimes if you have broken parts of stems with a little bit of roots, they can re-root and grow back. And maybe that's one of the, the best, I guess, uh, features of as much grass and worse when you think about management, is that as much grass is a very prolific seed producer. The estimations are around 45,000 seeds per plant which would give us around 80,000 seeds per square meter. And as much grass not just produce a lot of seeds, but it does that for a long period of time. So maybe we would be seeing flowering happening from April to December, with flowering, immature, mature, and shattering uh, seeds occurring at the same time on the same plant. What about seed viability? So there was some research done in Florida, and they found that <coughs> around one to just not not more than ten percent of the seeds are viable. However, when they go through some source of mechanical specification, this the seed viability was uh, higher than ninety-four percent. And we also have some studies done in Australia, and they said that switch grass seeds viability is around or more than nine percent. And also. Uh, but before I go to the next, if you think about that, let's say that it is 9 person. We are, we, let's not even consider 94 person. If you think that 9 person out of 45,000 seeds that each single clump is producing, it is still a lot of seeds. And it is, a, it is considered a long-lived perennial plant. So long-lived perennial because leaves more than one, 
which would be annual, and it's more than two years, which would be a biannual win. And we, we believe that the, the, a single clump would live for at least four years. And if you think about it, it is a perennial plant. What does it mean? So that means that usually it is harder to control perennial plants. And the reason is because they tend to recover faster and better from single control management strategies that usually some, when we don't have a complete, con complete control, usually the perennial ones will recover better. So for example, burning, mowing, or contact herbicides, perennial plants tend to have to, to cope better with those type of management methods. Some conclusions about the biology and, and, and reproduct reproductive biology and life cycle is that much grass has the ability to produce a large amount of viable seeds and during a long period of time, which creates a very large seed bank. That's one of the main problems. So therefore, again, it's very hard to prevent seed production and to prevent seed bank replenishment with a single application, again, with any type of control method. All right, so in terms of growth habit, Growth habit is basically the way the plants grow. And there are some uh, management practices that they are, the effectiveness of them are very well related to the growth habit of the plant. So, for example, mowing and grazing are one of these. So, if you think about this picture, this figure here on the left bottom corner, we have this plant in the center, that we, is what we call a prostate prostrate growth habit, and we have this one other one on the left that is an upright type of growth habit. So usually, not always, but usually, plants with a, a upright type of growing habit, they are more susceptible to be controlled with mowing or grazing. And the reason is because they have their growing points located on the top, uh, at the grazing height or at the mowing height. So every time you go there and mow or grazing, we are removing those growing points and that can sometimes work very well and we have and we can have good control and on the other hand plants that are prostrate because they have this more creeping close to the soil surface they are usually they are protected of those type of things and they usually they cope very well but what about smudge grass much grass would be the upright type however we cannot assume that just because much grass has an upright growing head type, it is susceptible to grazing or mowing. That does not work with much grass because even though it's a clump bunch type of grass, the growing point points are very like deep inside of the clump, so they are protected. So like the picture in the right, sometimes most of the most of the times we will mow or graze, doesn't matter the the stubble height that we live as much grass will grow back. And persistent in the soil, that's a very important one that is very well related to management. So research here in Florida by Neha uh, found that seed, the much grass seeds, they don't have any type of dormance. However, again, research in Australia says that much grass has a special type of dormancy that is called innate dormancy. Innate dormancy is basically the ability to do not germinate right after the seeds are uh, released, they are in the, in the environment, when situations are not totally suitable. But regardless if as much grass has in, in a dormancy or not, it is, it has a very, it can, it stays in, uh, it has a very long longevity. This is also some research done in Australia, and they found that pretty much even after almost nine years, Around 20% of the seeds that were on the, on the ground, they were still viable. So, 10 years, 20%, 20% out of 45,000, it is still a lot of seeds. And the, the main message here is that uh, if you still have viable seeds in the soil, that means that every year you have the chance of new infestation. So that means that as much grass control requires long-term management. Conclusions, a very large and long-lived seed bank and long-term measurement is a must. What about mode of dispersal? How, do we, how does it spread? Mainly through cattle manure, cattle coats, other livestock, vehicles, machinery, water, hay and pasture seed. Now, the good news about that is that most of these things are influenced by humans, so that, might, that there is a chance to be managed and avoided. 
And that's, it is a big deal because it is way better to deal with these much better infestations at the beginning when they are not too dense. And prevention is basically the, the cheapest way to, to deal with weeds. All right, guys. So now we are move, shifting gears to is much grass versus management uh, strategies. Trying to relate all the, this information that we have gone through with different types of methods of control. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is mowing. So mowing can be a very effective weed control method sometimes. And it works by removing the tops of the weeds prior to seed formation. That's when we can achieve that, that's when mowing works the best against weeds. And, and also another, another factor that makes mowing work is that when we do it repeated times, for an extended period of time, again for some weeds, not all, we can deplete the underground food reserves of the plant. And that can make the plant very weak and <clears throat> And sometimes we can we can achieve control by doing that. So, how does it work with smudge grass? What are the strengths of mowing against smudge grass? First of all, it allows smudge grass to be grazed for three weeks after mowing, so that can be seen as an advantage. And we we have done some research, professors in Florida, that shows that uh, smudge grass stored food reserves that I just mentioned they decrease after a couple of consecutive mowing, and also the diameter of the clamps decrease. However, unfortunately, there are way more weaknesses than strengths when you think about using mowing to control as much grass. The first one is that mowing is not very effective against perennials. It's more effective against annuals and biennial plants, and as much grass is a perennial plant. We have seen increase of seed head production after mowing, and maybe the, the biggest drawback is that when we mow after seed production, we are actually spreading the seeds throughout the pasture. And seed production occurs pretty much during the entire growing season, so most likely you are going to be doing that after seed production. And that decrease that I mentioned in the reserves of the plants and even the diameter, unfortunately, as, as soon as we stop mowing, they just get, get back to the regular size and even though we thought, oh, maybe they, they have less energy because they have less uh, stored riser, reserves, maybe we will be able to control it better with herbicides. We did not see any, any interaction. So, uh, that can be also seen as a weakness. Weaknesses. Alright, so what about fire or prescribed burn? The use of fire to control it is not actually something new. It has been used since uh, the prehistoric times. And the main goal of when you think about fire for vegetation management is to reduce the fuel loads, loads to restore the historical disturbance regime, regimes, to improve forage and habitat, and to promote biodiversity. However, fire or prescribed burn can also be used as a tool to manage invasive weeds, weeds such as smudge grass. And the first strength is that like I mentioned earlier, around 70% of all, all these much grass seeds are found in the top half an inch of the soil. That means that they are susceptible to be controlled by fire. And there are some studies that have found that approximately 50% of all those seeds that are in the top layer of the soil, they, they were killed by fire due to the high temperatures. And another good thing is that fire stimulates seed germination with an emergence and seedlings emergence which we can be seen as an advantage because later when we impose, for example, some herbicide treatments, we, we have those plants there also uh, to, be, to be affected. So we are, and because they germinated from the soil and, not, and assuming that we are killing them, that helps us to de deplete the soil seed bank. Fire, like mowing, increases palatability, allowing grazing for three weeks after, mow, after burning. burning. But what are the problems? It's not very effective in controlling as much grass mature plants. Like I said, as much grass kind actually lacks fire. And when we do a lot of burnings repeated times, we actually we are more doing more a favor to as much grass. That actually helps to, to spread as much grass over other plants. And also fire, we need to be careful because it needs to be managed, managed properly because it has the potential to, to cause de detrimental impacts to the environment. For example, 
sorghum matter depletion, appearance of background, soil and nutrient runoff, and the emission of the greenhouse gases. All right, that's the last control method I'm going to cover, which is the chemical control through the use of herbicides. And herbicides, not just uh, everywhere when you think about crop insistence, that's the most common way that people use to control it. And the main reason is because it is very efficient, it is usually cheap, not very expensive, and uh, it is pra practical, has a very good feasibility. Doesn't require a lot of time and labor. For as much grass control, we have basically two active ingredients that are effective. The first one is hexesnone, which can be found uh, in different uh, trade names. And we also have glyphosate, which has a bunch of different trade names. Now, hexesnone like, is the only one that is selective, so that is safe to be applied over the top without. Uh, harming too much or, or the, without harming our forages. However, glyphosate, if you if you think about this picture in the center, which is the weed wiper, when we use glyphosate with weed wiper, that allows us another opportunity to use a selective herbicide. Because the main idea of the weed wiper is to have the weeds taller than your forages. So when you go out there and, and, and actually wipe the weeds, you are touching just the weeds. So that can be considered also selective application. And we are doing some studies looking at that, trying to figure out what is the best rate, if you need to do once or twice, different directions. So the strains with herbicides are very efficient when it works, and we are going to go through that. And it's very practical. We have a hexes node, that is our selective option, and I just mentioned that glyphosate can be selective applied. But what are the, the, the issues? What are the weaknesses? Uh, we have a very limited uh, option in terms of selection herbicides. We have just one, which is hexesnone. And this only option is very expensive. It's probably one of the most expensive pasture herbicides treatments. And not just that, sometimes we have been seeing some lack of control with the use of hexesnone. And the main reasons for that is because of the results of these three factors. The hexesnone properties, the soil properties, and the, the rainfall pattern that, pattern that we have in Florida. So the way that hexesnone works is that it is it, it is absorbed by the leaves. However, the main absorption absorption happens through the roots. So unfortunately, it requires a little bit of rainfall to be incorporated in the soil, to be in the root zone, and to be absorbed. And also, the soil properties does, doesn't help us very much because most of the soils are very sandy. And that just means that the soil doesn't have a lot of properties that will hold the herbicide in the soil. It's very easy to leach, to see leaching. And the rainfall pattern. Uh, and we're going to go through that now. So I put together this, trying to make to, to explain a little bit better the interaction of the hexesnone, the, 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 the rainfall, and how everything works in the field. So let's think that this is, we are in the field. And here is the soil surface, and this is the, the root zone that I call, the area where we can find most of the roots of squash grass. So let's think that we are going out there and we are spraying the plants. What will happen is the herbicide will touch the leaves, some of the herbicide, but most of the herbicide will be staying right there in the soil surface. So let's think that for this situation, we did not have any rainfall at all after the first 7, 10 days after application. So what ha will happen is the herbicide will still be there in the surface and will not be in the root zone. It's a problem because most of the absorption occurs through the roots. So basically when something like that happens, the type of control that we will see is that because we are not seeing a lot of absorption going on. So even though we can see some burning on the top, the leaves are kind of burning, the majority of the clumps is still green. And most likely during the next year, they were looking very as good as the untreated plants. Okay, so let's think about a different situation now. We go, we, we went out there, we sprayed, and this time we had what I'm calling here ideal amount, but I will explain that later, of rainfall. So if you had the ideal amount of rainfall within the, seven, the first seven or ten days after the application, what will happen is the herbicide molecules will actually be, most of them will be found within that ideal root zone. That's where we want the herbicide to be. That's where we have most chance that plants will actually absorb the herbicides. 
And this, this is another research that we are doing in one of the field trials that we are going to stop during the field tour. And so far, we are still conducting some trials. What we have seen is, uh, looks like that we need to have at somewhere between 0.25 to 3 minutes of rain after application. Most of the times, if you have a, this, type, this amount of rain within the first 7, 10 days after application, what we have seen is something like that, a way better type of control. And then finally, the third possible situation is we went there, we sprayed, and now we had too much of rain. Which is not too hard to have, especially during the rainy season here in Florida. So most of the, most of the times what will happen is now the herbicide move it too much down deeper in the soil profile. And they, again, they are not in the root zone, so the chance of absorption will not be very high. And most of the times what we will see will be something like that. Not very good control. And finally, the, 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 the last problem with, you, with you herbicides, I mean, not just herbicides, this is for hexesnone, is that it, it is little to oak trees. So sometimes for situations where they have a lot of oak trees, around, close, that might limit the, the use of this herbicide. All right, guys, so finally, just wrapping up, some, some of we can conclude some of the, the key attributes for as much grass species success is lack of affordable, selective, and efficient herbicide options, low palatability or preference when mature and not burn or mold, high tolerance to disturbance events, what I mean by disturbance events like mowing or burning, and also is very tolerant to stress events such as low soil pH and low soil fertility. It can germinate and emerge over a wide range of different situations, that is a large production of seeds during a large period of time, really makes control hard. And not just that, the, the seeds can live for a very long period of time in the soil. So I, I think the home take message is only through long term integrated with management is that we have a chance against too much grass. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, back when we were talking about mowing, is there a, uh, a height at which you could uh, call it with that party? A proper stable height? If you are always trying to control it or trying to maybe use it? Uh, either or would be control. Well, actually, control with mow, uh, if, you're trying, if you, the goal of mow is to control, I think it's, that's not a very good idea. Because we have tried like five, six mowing, uh, consecutive mowings in a row, and I think Dr. Serres will talk about this experiment. I'm not sure. No? Okay. <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what we have seen is that even after five or six repeated mowing, uh, it is not enough to control because, and I guess, kind of, even in the greenhouse, when you try to cut the plants in the pots very close, like half an inch, they always grow back. And I think it's because, like I, like I mentioned, the growing ponds are too well deep in the clump, they're protected. So, if the goal is using more into control, I think it doesn't matter the stable height, you'll not be very successful. Okay, so what would be your uh, mode height to use it? Great. Okay, that's, I, I have no idea, I'll be honest. I think we need to do a lot of research if you are planning to go through that route. And yeah, I don't know. Maybe start following this double height recommendation for forages and see what happens. So there's a question around bowing. How long after the seed stock goes up to the seed to disperse or become viable? So if you want to you know, see it come out, you want to uh, decrease the seed presence in the bag. All right. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think it doesn't take too long. It's very quickly. Do, do you know the answer for this, Dr. Sellers? 16 days. So about 16 days from flowering, you'll have viable seed. And the issue is that they, they does not occur like uniformly at the same time. So in the same in the same seed they have, they have mature seed, immature seed, and shattering seed going on. So it's very hard. That's another one of the why is much grass so problematic. Yes, sir. Back to your slide on the rainfall. 
you don't you want two to three tenths of, of rain up to two inches, but you don't want to go to three inches. So are you are you your layer of soil that you're trying to get to X on it would be <coughs> six inches at max? Is that correct? Yeah, it is like thirty. What's the root zone? How big is your root I, zone? I believe most of the root zone would be found in the first six, seven inches. And and with that. With those materials on herbicides, have you done anything to use any of these attributes that, that block that into that top two to three inches of soil? Uh, yes, we are actually con doing one experiment right now, but only the greenhouse with an energy one that helps to avoid leaching. And we are still analyzing the data. We don't know yet if it, it is actually improving the fixie or if it's not helping at all. But we are looking at that. And if, if that works, possibly take you that seven to ten days worth of time zone to possibly one, maybe two of possibly effective herbicide on that? Yes, sir, possibly. However, the longer this, this the herbicide is in the soil surface, the more susceptible it is for photodegradation. So then another issue might happen. So it might help us with the rainfall, but I'm not sure what will happen with the other issues. Do you have a, a time frame on that for the, the sunlight to break it down? Yes, if you look at the label, I think most of the photo degradation happens within the first 15 days. Like 70% will be in the first 15 days. Once the sun part gets into that root zone, how long does it take that plant to take it up? Well, everything depends if the soil is moist, moist. So, I would say if you have moist present, it will be right away. But the time that takes for us to, to tell that the, the, the treatment worked it or not is around 30 days after application. And that's not just because of the absorption, it's just because of how the herbicide works on the plant. It takes a, a while. So if you get that two to three tenths to get in that root zone and it's in there for five days before you get that three inches, you've probably got enough up there to kill. Yes. I will go back to you, sir. Can you go, sir? Have y'all found any difference with uh, burning the plant grass and spraying it or not burning it spray? Is there any difference? Yes, sir. That's a very good question. And I think I'm going to go through that during my next presentation. That's one of the experiments that we did, kind of looking at ex exactly the, the, this type of question. What happens if you have burning and then grazing? Can it increase our efficacy of our herbicides? I'm going to go, cover that. Yes, sir. Right, sir. So, what is the difference between rotation and continuous grazing in terms of smooth grass management? And again, that's going to be the topic of the next question. We're going to only talk about grazing management. Brent, I've heard some rumors on, on mixing your farms with all the grazing Does the ground need to be dry before you apply it? 
so yeah, so the question was, does, do, does the ground need to be dry before we apply? And actually, no, sir, that's actually the other way around. So every time we are thinking about uh, spraying, herbicide to control weeds, kind of regardless if the herbicide is... No stain in water. Oh, okay. So, okay, yeah, I mean, the soil needs to be moist, that's, that's always better. Never apply when it's dry. And in terms of staging water, that's, that's a good question, I'm not sure, because I think it, that's not very beneficial, because we can also have some breakdown by like uh, hydrolysis when, they, when it's in the water. However, we went some pastures last, last year or two years ago, and actually the, the, the guy that the pastor told us that when he sprayed, he had a uh, floating situation and he had a pretty good control. So I'm not sure, maybe some of one experiment that we should do, I'm not sure. It's kind of difficult because if you have standing water for too long and then you wait for the water to go away and then go out and spray, I've seen this happen twice when it actually it absolutely annihilated the hay grass. So it's kind of a catch-20, right? So you want the moisture, but you don't want too much for too long. So chopping clumps, I'm going to talk about that one too. So ask me again later. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, after you spray and you see your clump grass is dying or dead, any pros, cons, recommendations on mowing? Should we leave it and just let it die and build over and fall over and decay? Or go in there and mow it off? I mean, is there or burn it? Or burn it? I mean, uh. I guess, sir, in my opinion, I think it, it is not worth the extra, exp the extra cost. I mean, I think the, 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 the later mowing after the herbicide, and especially if you know that it worked, I think it's not bringing it up to the table a lot of benefits. benefits. However, if you do plan to mowing because of other reasons, and you're just using the same, I think that might be okay, but if you think about, oh, let's move after just kind of to make sure it works, I don't think it will be very helpful. Uh, and then somebody said burning, right? Yes, burning. Burning can be used probably during the next growing season, but for a different reason as well, like for an integrated approach. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that during my next slide. But uh, yes, burning has a potential to, to, to be benefit if used properly. After spraying the existing plant, would be that you've got all that dead plant there that burns and you're good and hot is to get the, get the seed that's laying on top of the ground. Yeah. However, I don't know because usually we are going to apply during mid July. Do, can we burn during the rain season? I'm not sure if it will be very effective the burning. That's why usually we do at the beginning of the, the spring, during the spring. 
But uh, do, do you have any other comments on that, Dr. Sellers? You know, sometimes the fires don't get hot enough to kill the seeds, so you end up actually promoting germination. So, as I think about it, I'd rather let it decay because it gives you a little bit of mulch. And if there's any bay grass seed, it can sometimes germinate through that. You won't end up with as much bare ground. You'll see bare ground in some of this plots this afternoon. Yeah, that's another issue. Bare ground means the chance of other weeds go there and fill the bare ground. So that's why it's important to have a, a health pasture, because you want that the pasture fill in the gaps, not other weeds. Sir, sir, what, do you have a question? On the, uh, the oak trees, is, they're very susceptible to the herbicide, but how about pine trees? Do they, they do the thing with it? Pine trees are fine. I'm going to let Jose get started on this next presentation, but i got to switch him over real quick. Also, in these folders, there's, on the left-hand side, there should be two surveys. One short, that's for today. The other one is more of a, a thinking survey, if you will. Um, and that is something that I'm really using to uh, complete my USDA NEFA project. So I need that information. It's a longer survey, but if you can take some time today and fill that out, I would certainly appreciate it.